The first lesson for this New Year's Day worship service is taken from the book of Psalms, Psalm 90. It's been associated with New Year's for, for many, many years. It's usually one of the le scripture lessons or the psalm of the day for New Year's Day. Today we'll read Psalm 90 in its entirety together as a congregation. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to seventy years, or eighty, if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger. Your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. This is God's word. The second lesson for this New Year's Day is taken from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. One of the most comforting passages in all of God's word. Paul writes, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, Neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is God's word. The Holy Gospel for us this morning is taken from the book of Matthew chapter 6 beginning at verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? 
for the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the gospel of the Lord. God's grace and his mercy and his peace belong to each and every one of you through the merits of Jesus Christ, God's Son and our Savior. Amen. Our text is a twofold text this morning. First from Ecclesiastes chapter 1. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. And then from Colossians chapter 3 verses verse 17, which was actually a portion of the second lesson yesterday. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is God's word. May we always learn and benefit from that word of God. Dear brothers and dear sisters in Christ Jesus, who is our Lord and our Savior, the one who gets us through each year, the one who stands by us at the beginning of another year. I always wondered back in school, back in college, why we had to learn about Greek mythology. I'm not sure exactly what subject it was part of, but I know that we had a unit on Greek mythology, the legends of, of all the Greek gods like Zeus and Poseidon and Aphrodite and, and Herma and Apollo, all of those Greek gods that supposedly did all these wonderful things in life. I think, as I get older, that it was kind of like maybe the Aesop's fables that you might have heard in your life once upon a time. I don't know if where I learned those, if it was maybe my mom or dad that was reading them to me, or maybe if I learned them in school possibly, but Aesop's fables are, are kind of those stories that teach us life lessons by means of giving us a, a, a neat little story, kind of like Jesus did in the, Old Test, or in the New Testament with his parables, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Maybe that's why we have Greek mythology in, in our curriculum back when I was in college. But there is one story that has stuck with me, and, and from time to time you hear this word Sisyphean, and, and, and it's based on one of those Greek legends about a man by the name of Sisyphus. Sisyphus was a king in Greek mythology of a particular city, and he had a lot of arrogance and a lot of pride in him. So when he died, he was sentenced to one job in the underworld. Hades sent him down to hell after he died. And again, this is all Greek legend. And his job, one job, was to take a rock, a boulder, a round boulder, and he was supposed to push it up a hill. Actually, it was more like a mountain. But the problem is, every time he, he did the work and actually got that boulder up to the top of the mountain, guess what? Slipped. Or the, the gods made it so that it got away from him and it rolled all the way back down the mountain. And then he would have to go back down to the bottom, take the rock, and start all over again. And it didn't just happen once or twice. This was an eternity. Rolling the rock up, working hard, sweating hard, getting up to the top, only to have it come out of his grip, watch it roll back down, having to go back and hike down and turn around and do the very same thing again. Over and over, day after day, month after month, for an eternity. The, the story came to symbolize, and it symbolizes today, that's where we get the, the word Sisyphean. <clears throat> it came to symbolize the, the, the feeling that sometimes people get when you think you're working hard, you know you're working hard, but it seems like you're accomplishing nothing doing the same thing over and over and over and every day, and you think, am I making any kind of impact in my life? Is, is, is life changing because of what I'm doing? Have you ever had that feeling? In life, everybody kind of has that feeling from time to time. Students have that feeling, don't they? You get up on a Monday morning and you pack up your backpack and you go to school and you work hard all day. You come back from school, you do your homework, you go to bed, only the next morning to 
go to school again. And you get more homework. And the reward for your hard work is more homework and more homework and every single day going back to school with a couple of vacations in between just to kind of give you a little bit of a break. Accomplish it, accomplishing anything? When you're students, you don't really think that you're accomplishing anything. Homemakers feel it. <clears throat> a mom changes a diaper and she thinks she's good for a while. But two hours later, she has to take that same baby and take that diaper that she just put on off and put another diaper on. You, you think that you're cleaning the house and you go through the whole house and you pick up after your kids and you pick up after your husband and, and, and just when you think that now the house should be clean, you go back into one of those rooms that have already been cleaned and you find, was I here? Did I do anything here whatsoever? That's the life of a, of a homemaker. You go to work, and you've got a pile of paperwork at work, and you work hard all day to get through all of those papers and all of the things that you need to do, only to go home, get a good night's sleep, come back to work, and guess what? The pile is still there, and it seems like it's grown by a couple of inches. And so you go through that paperwork again, and you do the very same thing. You accomplish everything, and the next day, it's the same thing. If you're on assembly line in a factory, you do what you have to do. You do your particular job, and it's done. And you send it down the line, and all of a sudden, you look down that conveyor belt, and you see a hundred more jobs just the same waiting for you to do them. Whatever your job is, doesn't it feel like sometimes you're working hard, but yet you're not accomplishing anything? It becomes monotonous. It becomes frustrating. It becomes repetitive. It becomes unimportant and pointless and futile. It can feel like that, especially at the end of another year, because at the end of the year, what do you do? You kind of take stock. How was my life this past year? What can I gain from my life this past year? Was there any gains? Were there any gains? Have I accomplished anything? Have I made an impact on the world or my family at all at the end of this another year? You look back and you think back to the beginning of January, and it's basically the same thing that you're going to be doing in the next couple of days. Whether you're working, whether you're retired, you're just going about the very same jobs, doing the very same things. You didn't change the world. You, you don't think that you've accomplished or impacted anybody positively. Has anything changed? What is the point of living at all if we're going to do the same thing over and over and over again and nothing is going to come out of it? You know, the Greeks had their stories of, of Sisyphus and, and we have our own stories that kind of make us think that we've accomplished nothing and nor do we think that we're going to accomplish anything in this new year. The Bible had their own version of this particular story and it's called the book of Ecclesiastes. We don't know exactly who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, but most likely it was a man by the name of Solomon. It's the same King Solomon that you and I know as the wisest man who has ever lived, the wealthiest man of his time and of his era. As the wisest man, as the richest man in the world at his time, he had everything that money could buy. He did anything and everything that money could buy. He had every experience that money could buy. And yet, at the end of his life, he looks back at everything and he says, you know what? Everything that I've done is meaningless. Go through the book of Ecclesiastes for those, for those 14 chapters and you'll find that word meaningless over and over and over and over again. Meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Life under the sun is meaningless. I, he looked at all the things that he thought that he accomplished and King Solomon, the king of this nation, great nation at that particular time, Israel, he considered it meaningless. After a lifetime of, as he says, toiling under the sun, he doesn't think that he has accomplished anything. And you know what? <clears throat> He's absolutely right. He hadn't accomplished really anything. And the legend of Sisyphus is right as well. If 
you see your life as existing apart from the Lord. If you think that your life is simply going to be wonderful and impactful and, and, and meaningful, and you think that you can do that apart from the Lord, apart from God, then yes, you're going to fall into that same trap as, as, as Solomon did and as Sisyphus did and as sometimes we do in our own lives, thinking back then and, and seeing that we've accomplished nothing. But if you see your life as an important cog in the life of God's people, then you can't look back and say, my life has been meaningless and my future life is meaningless as well. You see, God, <clears throat> in, in the beginning, God did not design us to live on our own and for ourselves and only serving ourselves. He designed life to be centered around him, finding fulfillment in him and work done for him, finding joy in work in him and done for him. When creation fell, that's when we get our, our, our words like meaningless and nothingness and repetitiveness and monotony and frustration. That's when sin crept into this world. But you did not come here this morning to get more and more bad news. Because really, that's what this whole sermon has been so far. It's been bad news. What can I look forward to in this new year? Absolutely nothing, according to the pastor. There's good news in every sermon. There's good news any time that you walk into God's house. And the good news that overwhelms that feeling of frustrationness, frustration and meaninglessness is the good news that we hear that happened 2,000 years ago. When God sent his son into this world to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, to give us hope when there was absolutely no hope, to give us a future when we had no future, to look back at the past and say, what we did in him, that wasn't nothing, that wasn't meaningless, that wasn't futile, that was something for him. He, he goes on and he sends the Holy Spirit into our lives, giving us faith in what Jesus has done for us and reminds us of not what King Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, but what St. Paul says in the book of Colossians, whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Paul says it again. He says, whatever you do, if you're eating or if you're drinking, if you're working, whatever you're doing, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul even makes a, a more impactful statement in the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He spends 50-some verses talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And then at the very end of, of 1 Corinthians 15, he talks this way. He says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that the labor in the Lord is not in vain. Not in vain. Not worthless, not futile, not meaningless, not pointless, not any of those words that we've used so far. In our journey of life, when we're working for the Lord, when we, when we do things our best for the Lord, it's not any of those things. It is meaningful, and it's the opposite of futile. Does your life have purpose? Does your life have meaning? Does your life, your work, have value in the whole scheme of things? Absolutely. When you're doing it for the Lord God who gave you everything in this life and also for the next life. When you set your sights on things above, more so than the things of this world, God will bless your efforts. This new year, may that again be your goal. To eat and to drink and to work and to play, and to do everything in the name of and for the Lord Jesus. Thankful for what he's done for us, and that will ensure you a meaningful, happy new year. Amen. The peace of God, which goes beyond our understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.